Um, so welcome everybody again. I am so glad that you are here. I want to give you a little bit of information about ADL. Since our founding in 1913, ADL has always fought anti-Semitism and to secure justice and fair treatment for all. Misinformation, disinformation, and conspiracy theories have led to hate, racism, anti-Semitism, and violence. Once largely regulated to white supremacist rhetoric, the Great Replacement Theory has made its way into mainstream consciousness in the past several years. This conspiracy theory is rooted in claims that white Europeans and Americans are being replaced by black and brown immigrants. These narratives bolster anti-immigrant rhetoric and hate while promoting racist, xenophobic, anti-Muslim, and anti-Semitic tropes that invigorate the extreme right. Today, you will hear from a panel of experts to discuss how anti-immigrant, how this anti-immigrant movement has gone mainstream and the practical impact that it has had on immigration policy, including the treatment of asylum seekers and refugees. In order to have a distraction-free program, participant mics and videos have been turned off. Like I said before, if you have a question for a panel, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit your question. It is my pleasure to now welcome Dr. Daniel Byman, professor and at Georgetown University Walsh School of Foreign Services Security Studies Program and Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institute Center for Middle East Policy. Dr. Byman served as professional staff member with the National Commission on Terrorist Attacks on the United States, the 9-11 Commission, and the Joint 9-11 Inquiry Staff of the House and Senate Intelligent Committees. He also worked as the research director of the Center for Middle East po Public Policy at the RAND Corporation and as a Middle East analyst for the U.S. intelligence community. His latest book, which just published, is titled Spreading Hate, the Global Rise of White Supremacist Terrorism. Joining Dr. Byman is Marilyn Mayo. Marilyn is a senior research fellow at ADL Center on Extremism. She's been with ADL for 25 years, having previously served as the co-director of ADL Center on Extremism and the Associate Director of Investigative Research at ADL. Ms. Mayo is an expert on right-wing extremists in the United States, ranging from white supremacists, academic racists, and to anti-immigrant groups. She often speaks to the media and law enforcement about the activities of hate groups and movements across the country. She has worked on numerous reports for ADL and is a regular contributor to ADL's blog. Also on our panel from the Southern Poverty Law Center based in Atlanta, please welcome Sarah Rich. Ms. Rich is a senior supervising attorney at the Southern Poverty Law Center. Sarah works in so Southern Poverty Law Center's Immigrate Immigrant Justice Project, where she litigates civil rights and employment cases on behalf of immigrants and refugees and advocate, advocates for policies and laws that improve immigrants' working conditions for respect and immigrants' rights. Sarah received a law degree from UC Berkeley School of Law and a master's degree in public policy from the School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. Rounding out our panel is Talia Steinberg, our moderator for today's conversation. Talia is the Associate Director of Government Relations at ADL. Ms. Steinberg served as one of ADL's federal legislative and executive branch advocates in support of the organization's policy agenda and helps to develop ADL's advocacy strategies and campaigns in the areas of anti-Semitism, extremism, and civil and human rights concerns. Talia has also helped lead ADL's national efforts to advocate for immigration and refugee rights. Welcome to everybody who's attending. Welcome to our panelists. And Talia, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Margie. And thanks to, so much for everybody uh, to join us on our call today. And thanks to our panelists. This conversation is especially relevant during the Passover holiday this week. As the Jewish community recounts our own history, their own history of persecution, of seeking refuge, and of facing prejudice and hate. So just to set the scene. 
Daniel, can you uh, talk to our audience about what the great replacement theory is and how it originated? And because we're at ADL here, how it's become part of the larger anti-Semitic trope? Uh, sure, but let me begin simply by thanking you, um, everyone else at the ADL and my, my co-panelists. Uh, I rely on you so much for my own research and it's really an honor to, to be here. Um, as Margie said in the introductory remarks, the Great Replacement is actually a relatively simple idea. And it's that white people are being replaced by non-white people. And in the eyes of its proponents, there are certain countries and parts of the world that belong to white people. So the United States, Canada, Australia, parts of Europe, and so on. And that um, through immigration and other changes, uh, these are becoming white minority areas. And Although the idea is relatively recent, in this broader community, there's a long-standing, almost eternal concern about what they would call the future of the white race. And there have been numerous rallying cries over the years claiming that the white race is imperiled, white children are going to be defiled, and so on. Um, with the Great Replacement, although it um, begins with this idea of immigration, and if we go back to this specific term, comes out of a French writer in 2011. Um, he was concerned specifically about Muslim immigration and higher birth rates of Muslim minorities. Uh, but you can throw a lot of ideas into this concept, which is what makes it so popular and so powerful. Uh, what is intermarriage? You can say that through intermarriage, the white race is being watered down. And as I think everyone on the session knows, um, intermarriage has been an obsession of the white supremacist community for many generations. Um, you can also add a lot of particular concerns. So people who oppose abortion can say, well, the purpose of abortion is to control white birth rates. Um, if you're anti-gay, you could say that homosexuality is being promoted as a way to decrease white birth rate. So it shows up in lots of different contexts in lots of different parts of the world. Um, there is a question for this community where, you know, part of the initial ideas were simply this is happening through immigration. Um, and as a result, it's demographic change that uh, people argued should be stopped. Um, it quickly, however, uh, became a conspiracy that this is some broader plot, that there is a group of elites that are trying to impose the Great re Replacement in order to destroy whites. And whenever you say elites, that quickly becomes a group of Jews. And so there's a lot of overlap between traditional conspiracy theories about Jews trying to destroy Christians, trying to destroy whites, and so on. Um, and as a result, you get some very odd mixes. Uh, for example, those who know the, the very sad history of the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting, uh, where 11 people died in the worst anti-Semitic attack in, in US history, um, it comes from a shooter who blamed Jews for bringing Muslim uh, refugees to the United States. So it wasn't a traditional anti-Semitic concern, but rather one linked to the great replacement. So this flexibility, the broadness of it, have made it very powerful. Thank you so much, Daniel, and thanks for kind of setting up that definition for our audience here. Marilyn, can you talk about how the Great Replacement Theory is, is being perpetuated in the media and online uh, and how it's gone mainstream? Sure. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I'm very happy to be participating with my fellow pal panelists today uh, in this webinar. Um, of course, Daniel made some very important points about the Great Replacement and how it's been used to talk about the white race. But the way we're seeing this theory being mainstreamed is a little bit different in, in this way. We often see references to the great replacement theory in the media, um, and usually in right-wing media, but, the, but it's almost always couched in language that's um, somewhat different than for, uh, than, for example, what white supremacists might say. And, and Daniel gave some examples of that. Um, and what we're um, seeing is that media personalities like Tucker Carlson or Laura Ingram and, and, and others as well, um, they don't explicitly talk about people of color replacing white Americans in this country. They say that the Democrats slash liberals um, want an open border policy in order to change the demographics of the United States. And this is something we're hearing 
uh, a lot uh, in the in the right wing media, both online uh, in, in online publications and and on uh, TV news. Um, and um, you know, what does it mean to say that you know that uh, there's a policy that, and in fact, they think it's a well thought out policy, a planned policy, to change the demographics of the United States. Um, they talk about. Uh, I'm talking about the pundits who say this. They, they talk about immigrants from third world countries uh, being let into this country so that they can vote for the Democratic Party. And the implication, of course, is that, um, first of all, that non-white immigrants are replacing white, uh, for the most part, Christian Americans, and that this plan uh, to transform, it, it's this plan to transform America into a non-white majority country. So um, this, this idea is, is being used in many ways to create a lot of anger and rage for people who feel like the country is changing, that their place in the country is changing. And um, you know, the anger, you know, is, we're seeing it lead to some um, real life, I think, uh, actions, and, and we can get into that more later, but um, we're seeing these, this sentiment from a wide range of people from, from politicians, um, you know, to, to pundits, to, to uh, you know, just regular folks on social media. And I'll stop there. Thanks, Marilyn. Um, Sarah, I'd love to turn to you now to talk about what Margie started with about the, the real effect of this theory. How, how has this great replacement theory influenced US immigration policy? Hi, thanks Talia and thanks to the ADL for inviting me here today and of course to my co-panelists for sharing all of their expertise. Um, the short answer to this question is that um, Stephen Miller and the Trump administration showed us what US immigration policy would look like if run by white nationalists who believe in the great replacement theory. Um, SPLC has published some pieces on the influence of white nationalism and the great replacement theory on Stephen Miller's thinking and Miller was able to come up with essentially a white nationalist wish list on immigration and to implement much of it during the Trump presidency. Um, obviously, there were some anti-immigrant white nationalist politicians in the modern era before Trump, Tom Tancredo, Steve King, Jeff Sessions, whom Stephen Miller worked for. Um, but from Trump's announcement of his candidacy in 2015, the sort of the whole Mexicans are rapists and murderers, uh, <laughs> Um, announcement when he came down the escalator until the end of his presidency, he managed to make those positions mainstream Republican positions and to put them into practice. Um, some of the what I would call lowlights of this period include the Muslim ban and all of the subsequent rewrites that they had to adopt to get it past the Supreme Court. The attempt to defund quote unquote sanctuary cities the remain in Mexico or migrant protection protocols policy, um, the illegal metering and turnbacks of asylum seekers at the southern border, third country agreements to send asylum seekers to other countries for processing. Um, as indeed, Great Britain is actually trying to do this right now with Rwanda. We tried to do it with Guatemala and other countries. Um, the rhetoric around angel families, which were supposed to be families who had a, a family member who had been killed by someone without you know, legal immigration status, and just the general demonization, of course, of quote unquote illegals, which were always coded as Mexicans or other Latin Americans. Um, referring to Haiti and African countries as shithole countries and asking why we can't get more Norwegian immigrants instead. Uh, painting the entire asylum process as a quote loophole that only nefarious quote unquote illegals used to get into the country and not a an internationally recognized right uh, to seek protection from persecution. Um, there was more family separation, for example, but it's a lot, so that's probably enough for now. Um, some of that is gone, but a lot of it remains, unfortunately, and it has really normalized an approach to the border and to the concept of immigration that is illegal and also traps asylum seekers in a dangerous limbo. Um, in my opinion, I mean, this is all very deeply ironic to, to incorporate into US immigration policy, given that the presence of so many white people in this country is the result of centuries of open borders for white immigrants 
anyone who could qualify as white under the law, it was a legal term that you needed to fit into. And if you could, you could come here with basically no restrictions until 1921. Um, and so for white people to think that their presence on the North American continent and in this country is somehow a neutral fact or, or a natural outcome that must be defended and protected is extremely misguided. Um, one last point, um, we can see this play out right now with the reaction to Ukrainians who are coming to the southern border to seek protection. Um, not that they don't deserve protection, but so do all of the other people who are waiting and who are fleeing dangerous situations and government persecution. Um, we've managed to process some 10,000 Ukrainians through ports of entry on the southern border that are ostensibly closed to people seeking protection in the United States while simultaneously deporting you know, thousands of Haitians back to Haiti to an obviously dangerous situation and leaving hundreds of thousands of others, uh, mostly black and brown migrants, languishing in dangerous border towns waiting to seek protection, which again is their statutory right and a right under international law. Um, no one talks about Ukrainians coming to invade our country, take over our country, make us, you know, use Cyrillic to, <laughs> to write uh, or, or anything else that, you know, Ukrainian cultural influence might do to the United States. There's no moral panic about a flood or a surge, um, but you can compare that to the rhetoric around non-white immigrants and the contrast is quite obvious. Thank you, Sarah. And that last point I think is at the top of a lot of our minds as we're seeing millions flee war and persecution in Ukraine, in Afghanistan, and in all the other countries you, you mentioned. Um, I think that's a really crucial point, so thank you. Um, I'll turn it back to Daniel now. Um, Daniel, can you talk a little bit about how and why Great Replacement is foundational to white supremacist extremism? You touched on it at the beginning, but if you can go a little bit deeper. What I would emphasize is that the Great Replacement serves um, two purposes. Uh, one is it helps unify a very disparate movement. Uh, so if you look at white supremacists, you know, in a way they all agree that the white race is awesome and everyone else is not. But if you go beyond that, historically they've had very different emphases. And so sometimes it's been immigrants, sometimes it's been Jews. There's a constancy, sadly, of a focus on black people, but there are a lot of different priorities, and as a result, the movement has gone off in lots of different directions. Uh, this is a concept that helps unify both the extreme violent end um, and the, I don't quite want to say mainstream, but I'll say more political, less violent end. So if we look at some recent attacks around the world, you can see this popping up again and again. I mentioned the 2018 Tree of Life uh, Pittsburgh synagogue shooting. Um, in 2019, we see Brenton Tarrant uh, kill 51 Muslims at two mosques in New Zealand. He publishes a manifesto. What's it called? Uh, it's called The Great Replacement. Uh, later in that year, we see a white supremacist um, in California um, release an online manifesto after an attack talking about the genocide of white Europeans. Um, then we see an attack in Texas that kills 23 people at an El Paso Walmart where the shooter is talking about an invasion of Hispanics. And so we're seeing this concept show up again and again against different supposed enemies of the white race. Um, and the second point, and I think this is probably the most important, um, is that this is a powerful theory because it intersects with politics. Now, both Marilyn and Sarah have discussed this and said it better than I can. But I would emphasize that this comes from more mainstream, less violent political debates. Right, The person who originates this idea in 2011 is not someone calling for blowing up synagogues, but he is trying to influence a broader political debate. Um, and then it goes to the extreme community, catches fire there, um, and then it comes back. And as horrible as the death of any innocent person is, uh, things get much worse when you go from the deaths of uh, relatively small numbers of innocent people to ideas that influence millions or tens of millions of people, and as a result, shape the lives of entire countries. And that's to me why this idea and all the associated ideas are so troubling. Thanks, Daniel. And you touched on, and something Marilyn also touched on, the online facet of this kind of spread of the theory, and that's something that ADL 
um, works a lot on through our Center for Technology and Society, through our Center on Extremism, um, and through our other folks working on tech policy. So this is the, the online spread, the spread of this hate online is a huge uh, part of ADL's work. And we'll definitely make sure to send some resources on that in our follow-up. So thanks for touching on that. Um, let's turn now back to Sarah. You again touched a little bit on this earlier, but can you talk about what Title 42 is and how the announcement that Title 42 will, will hopefully end um, uh, kind of is affected by great replacement or might affect great replacement um, and what we can expect for the end of Title 42 to look like in practice? Sure. Um, so first, some clarity on Title 42, which is a term that, you know, you may have heard in the news. Um, the name of this policy refers to the section of the US code, which is the codification of federal law on public health, social welfare and civil rights. The immigration section of the code is Title Eight. So this is not an immigration law. Section 265 of Title 42 gives the Surgeon General delegated down to the CDC director the authority to prevent people from entering the US if they could import a communicable disease or they could introduce a communicable disease. The policy was first adopted by the Trump administration but was only ever applied to asylum seekers including unaccompanied children. It was not applied to people with green cards. It was not applied to US citizens who are just as easily going to be vectors of disease um, as asylum seekers. Um, so the public health rationale was always pretty thin um, and it has since been undermined by many public health experts who stated publicly many times that this rule does not have any public health justification, especially not anymore, given that COVID has clearly been introduced uh, to the United States, it's here. Um, so th the idea that migrants will further introduce it is, quite questionable. Um, so US law and international law allow people who are in the United States or in the process of arriving at a port of entry to access the US asylum process. And Title 42, in addition to things I referred to earlier, including metering, turnbacks, and the Remain in Mexico policy, has been used to essentially end asylum at the southern border. Um, this is really quite revolutionary, and I don't know if that many people uh, have sort of clocked that this development has taken place in the past few years, but there is essentially no way to apply for asylum at the southern border right now. There hasn't been for years. Um, and since Title 42 was put into effect, the US government has carried out more than 1.7 million expulsions of asylum seekers pursuant to the authority granted by the CDC director's invocation of this uh, power. Now that doesn't mean there's 1.7 million people, um, as some people have tried to enter multiple times, so just to be clear. So the CDC director announced that Title 42 will end on May 23rd. Uh, various states, mostly non-border states run by Republicans, have sued the federal government in an attempt to prevent this outcome, but the CDC director has discretion to decide whether Title 42 is necessary or not, so their legal arguments seem unlikely to succeed to me, but we'll see what judges they get. Um, it's also telling that the states most opposed to COVID restrictions are the most in favor of keeping this one COVID restriction at the border that keeps mostly black and brown people out of the country. Um, unfortunately, a number of Democratic senators have also started pressuring the administration to keep Title 42 in place, mostly as an immigration control measure, which again, it is not. It is not an immigration control measure. It cannot be used for that purpose. It has a public health rationale. And if the CDC director decides in her discretion that that rationale no longer exists, then you can't keep it in place in order to prevent people from migrating here, which they have the legal right to do if they are seeking asylum. Um, it's very disturbing though that, that this uh, opposition to the end of Title 42 is creeping leftward on the political spectrum and that some Democratic senators are sort of copying the talking points related to, you know, we'll be, we'll be overwhelmed, we'll be flooded, you know, we'll be invaded, etc., which again is all language that is linked to this idea that will, you know, that black and brown immigrants will come here to essentially displace the white population. Um, it's, it's unclear what the end of Title 42 will look like and uh, what it will mean in practice. 
the Remain in Mexico program is still in place um, by court order, and thus the administration might just process people through that program and send them back to Mexico to wait for their court date, which could be months or years in the future. Um, so that means that these de facto refugee camps on the border will continue to exist in some, in some way. Um, I do expect that there will be extensive coverage of this on Fox and other right-wing outlets um, and even mainstream outlets. I'm seeing a lot of um, sort of middle of the road network uh, news coverage of this that keeps talking about it as a nightmare, as you know, some sort of um, just something to be feared. And I think that's also very, very problematic. Um, and I expect this to be a big issue in the midterms as well, which is probably why we hear the Democratic senators talking about it. Thanks so much, Sarah. Marilyn, can you kind of add to what Sarah started to discuss about the response to the end of Title 42 and how it's rooted in great replacement, both in the mainstream, like what Sarah mentioned, and from extremist sects? Sure. And uh, Sarah, I appreciate your very full explanation of, um, of Title 42. Um, we are certainly seeing a very big response to the um, end of Title 42 or the impending end, or if it, if, however that happens. Um, what we're seeing is many pundits and politicians talking about Title 42. And while, you know, while some, you know, I'll give, some may have some legitimate concerns, uh, you know, possibly um, about the country absorbing um, immigrants in some way, most of the rhetoric is really about uh, an invasion, as, as Sarah mentioned. It's really about um, an invasion and it alludes to the great replacement that, you know, that we've been talking about. Uh, the talk is about um, basically how getting rid of Title 42 is really about, again, bringing in non-white immigrants um, from third world countries who will vote for the Democrats in the midterms. And what, what's interesting about this is that, you know, of course, non-citizens non cannot vote in elections, although I guess people can, I, I'm sure what will come up is something about the New York law uh, that allows, um, I think it has to be, and, and maybe Sarah, you know more, I, I should know about this since um, it's my area, but I, I know that people who are not citizens are allowed to vote, not in federal elections, however, but, um, but I, I'm just bringing that up to give a fuller picture. The point is, uh, the talk is really about, again, this idea that there is a plan, a plan, and as, as Daniel mentioned, by the elites, by the global elites, by the globalists, by, you know, by the liberals, the progressives, the Democrats, George Soros. I mean, you, you just name it, all the conspiracies that come up around this, and that, there, that this is a well thought out plan to actually bring in um, these, you know, these non-white immigrants to replace, um, you know, white, uh, white America, but to also get them to vote, um, you know, in the midterm elections and, and therefore, uh, you know, keep the Democrats in power. And I think that um, another thing, a couple of things to add to that is that um, there's a, you know, in right-wing circles, we're hearing this sort of new idea, it's being presented that every state in the country is a border state, right? This, this is what's being promoted, this idea that it's not just Texas or Arizona or California, every single state is a border state. This is something that, you know, people need to think of when they think of, uh, you know, this, this uh, quote unquote invasion coming in and that, you know, it's akin to declaring war. I mean, I'm, I'm literally hearing people say this, that bringing in, letting in immigrants and getting rid of Title 42 is akin to uh, waging war against what is thought of as, and, and also named traditional America. So, um, you know, uh, someone like uh, Steve Bannon, for example, on his podcast, uh, War Room Battleground, talks about that this is worse than the invasion of Normandy because it's like, you know, Normandy had a limited number of, uh, you know, people and trying to invade the Normandy. However, this is like, you're talking about the potential for, I mean, he uses the number 7 million people. I mean, just like an incredible number. This is really being used to create a lot of fear and rage. And, and this is how it's being used. I wanna point out just something, you know, something, uh, you know, Daniel talked 
about earlier, which is that the great replacement is not only being promoted in this country, but in Europe as well, and, and being used in, in elections that are happening in Europe as well, like Marie Le Pen would be someone to talk about the great replacement in France uh, and, and others, you know, for sure. So um, we're certainly seeing a lot of this and um, it's something that Title 42 is like a tangible, you know, thing that they can grab onto. And as Sarah said, it's expanding beyond, uh, you know, the right. It's, it's because people are so afraid of this rage and, uh, you know, an anger on the part of, uh, you know, the population that they're, they're trying to figure out a way that they can, um, you know, basically, um, keep, you know, deal with this, deal with poly, some sort of immigration policy without angering this group that is just so angry in any case about any kind of, um, you know, uh, immigrants crossing the border. So uh, yes, and I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Marilyn, for sharing that. Um, just one last question for the panel, and then we'll start uh, taking audience questions. And this is for all of you. Daniel, I know you touched on this a little bit earlier, and throughout the panel, you've each spoken a little bit about this, but what threats are posed by the perpetuation of this great replacement rhetoric? And uh, Sarah, Marilyn, Daniel, if any of you wanna take it. Daniel, if you wanna start by expanding on what you said earlier. Sure, so my, my own research focuses on the violent end of the political spectrum. Um, and when you have uh, millions of people talking about this, including political leaders, including mainstream media outlets. Um, it's not surprising when a relatively small percentage um, decide they're gonna do something about it. And that means they're gonna kill someone, that means they're gonna use violence. And in their eyes, they see themselves as heroes. They're the ones acting, people around them are saying that there's a threat. And as upsetting and horrible as these people are, um, in many cases, they're not the brightest bulbs, they're easily swayed. It's other people who are whipping up sentiment, anger, and hatred that bear some responsibility for their words. And so we are going to see continued attacks um, in the name of ideas linked to the Great Replacement. Um, I would add uh, that it also has you know, incredibly dangerous implications for policy that when we think about immigration policy, not in context of you know, very basic economic questions or others, but with false assumptions and racist assumptions that the people coming in are murderers and racists, you don't get good immigration policy. And we can go issue area by issue area, but this is a dangerous distortion of what a political debate should be. And not only does it promote overt violence, it has a host of indirect effects that can affect thousands or even millions of people in very bad ways. Thank you, Daniel. Marilyn or Sarah, do you want to extend? Um, I'll, well, I'll just I'll just add that um, you know I agree with everything that that Daniel uh, has said. Um, you know, we I mean he gave very good examples of what happens when people are radicalized by the the idea that you know about the Great Replacement theory and you know Bowers, uh, uh, the Pittsburgh shooter, and 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 uh, Brenton Tarrant in New Zealand and Patrick Cruzius, and I think that. Whenever you demonize people uh, in ways that make them uh, basically inhuman, I mean, you're always, there's always a potential for people thinking uh, or, or for normalizing, I guess, you know, the really is the, the word, normalizing hatred and, and getting people to react and thinking that it's absolutely okay to take some kind of action. Um, and, I, and I think that's, you know, that's the danger here. Um, we're, we're certainly, we're certainly seeing that. And, and I, you know, I think that um, in the kind of polarization that we have in the country right now, this kind of rhetoric is being normalized. And, and, I, and that is, uh, I think, a little different than even what we've seen before. And it wasn't just in the last, you know, you know, like year, but it's been the last number of years, you know? So, so I, I think that it's, um, we're in a we're in a, a situation that um, calls for a lot of vigilance in terms of uh, seeing that we those of us who fight against hate and extremism keep up that fight. Thanks, Marilyn. Sarah, do you want to add to that? Like, well, just of course, echo what was said in that you know the 
the use of dehumanizing rhetoric and, and in immigration policy that tends to be rhetoric around floods, surges, invasions, et cetera. Um, the, the use of dehumanizing rhetoric like that is just sort of the first step toward classifying an outgroup as subhuman, non-human, and then everything's permitted once, once you've defined the outgroup as, um, as non-human. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we do see people taking this logic to its ultimate conclusion. Um, I also think this is dangerous um, because it's distracting um, and it's gonna get people thinking about all these identity issues and the border and immigration and, you know, new people, new neighbors who, you know, are different from them, et cetera. And, and it's distracting from other important issues that we also need to be paying attention to, or rather that we should be paying attention to. I personally don't consider changing immigration demographics a big deal, but, <laughs> um, and, and, but if we spend all of our time focusing on that, then we'll not, we're not focusing on other key issues that are also extremely important, um, such as threats to democratic system of governance that, <laughs> that we're trying to maintain. Thanks, Sarah. Sarah, I'll actually keep it on you for the first audience question. Uh, so first of all, thank you to our amazing panelists for answering such pressing questions. Our audience has been have been sending in tons of questions. And so some of these folks are accumulations of what you've been asking. This first one is a combination of several questions. Sarah, can you please discuss the shifting definitions of whiteness and how that's kind of played out in immigration policy over time, especially, you know, as a Jewish organization where I'm considering the fact that uh, you know, Jews were not always considered white yet, even though, you know, some of us aren't now. So I'd love to hear more about that. I'm um, sure. So um, the Naturalization Act of, I believe it was 1790, um, specified that only free white persons could become citizens of the United States. Um, that was the law until Black people could also become citizens after the Civil War, and then Black people could also naturalize. There were never that many Black immigrants in that time period. Um, there weren't any restrictions on who could physically move to the United States until the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Um, so we had open borders. Um, and we had open borders during the entire period when most white people's ancestors came to the United States. Um, that, but who could become a citizen was still defined by race, right? So you had to be white to be able to become a citizen. Who could count as white was extremely contested because obviously it would give you access to an entire range of benefits of citizenship. So being able to count as white was a big deal. And there's a book called White by Law by Ian Haney Lopez that goes through the history of Supreme Court and other court cases trying to define whiteness. And as you can imagine, it was <laughs> all over the place. And sometimes they would rely on eugenics based definitions of Caucasian. And sometimes they would rely on, you know it when you see it sort of like porn um, to determine who's white. And uh, people from East Asia would petition to be counted as white based on the color of their skin and their degree of civilization. People from Northern India would apply, arguing that they were legitimately Aryan and thus should count as white. Um, a lot of Syrians, Armenians, people from the Middle East had, you know, sometimes they would win, sometimes they would lose, depending on the judge, to be honest. Um, Jews from Europe generally counted as white. Uh, there was some pushback to that um, because people would argue they're actually Semitic and thus they shouldn't be counted as white. But generally, I mean, everyone who came from the Pale of Settlement or Eastern Europe and immigrated to the United States prior to 1921, they were able to come and then naturalize because they counted as white. Now, the big crackdown on immigration that passed in the Coolidge administration, one of Stephen Miller's heroes, um, passed in 1921 and a larger Immigration Act in 1924, was passed in order to end these the immigration of all these people that the WASP elite deem sort of lesser whites. So Italians, Poles, Hungarians, Jews, Greeks, you know, Southern and Eastern Europeans. They counted as white under law and could thus naturalize, but socially within sort of the 
hierarchy, the socioeconomic hierarchy of whiteness that existed within this country, the Protestant sort of English, Dutch, German, sort of older stock white people didn't like all these new people who qualified as white and thus they adopted a bunch of laws that were designed to cut down on the maximum numbers of them who could immigrate to the United States, even though all of those folks still qualified as white. So um, there's a lot of books that go into this in great detail, but I think the big takeaway is that most white Americans are descended from people who came in under an explicitly racist open borders policy that was designed to allow as many white people to come to the United States as, as wanted to come. Um, and once you know the elites realized that they were letting in the wrong kind of white people, they tried to change the law to make it a lot more targeted to get Northern and Western Europeans and not Eastern and Southern Europeans. Um, including the Jews who lived in, you know, the Russian Empire and, and Eastern Europe. Um, but it was always explicitly racist. Thank you, Sarah. That is a detailed history that I, I'm sure many in our audience, myself included, don't know, didn't know the full extent of. So that was really, really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, this next question is for Marilyn and or Daniel. You can you can both answer it. Um, how do people promoting the Great Replacement Theory incorporate ideas about LGBTQ plus folks? and abortion as a means to control rates of white birth? Um, if, you, if you're able to answer this question, Marilyn or Daniel. Uh, Daniel, I think you touched on that a little bit before, if you'd like to start. Sure, um, so the thing to remember with all this is there's a conspiratorial world of fake facts. So before we talk about you know, how people use it, you have to remember they're almost invariably using it wrong at best selectively interpreting existing facts, but usually just outright making stuff up. Um, so in this case, the idea is that uh, homosexuality, for example, is being promoted by, to go to Marilyn's point, by elites, liberals, globalists, on and on and on, whoever is behind the conspiracy, often Jews. Um, and part of the purpose is to move white women away from their traditional role as mothers whose job it is to propagate the white race. So by encouraging women to um, work, encouraging women to uh, be productive parts of the economy, to have a life outside the home, uh, they are being discouraged from having babies and therefore birth rates are going to favor non-whites. Um, and homosexuality is a variant of this by encouraging women or anyone to seek a partner of their choice. Uh, white women are going to have fewer babies and as a result, the white race is going to lose out. Um, abortion is a variant of that. It ignores the abortion rates of non-white communities. And here the assumption is it's being propagated in order to kill white children and again, affect birth rates. There are a million and one variations on these things. So there's no canon of the great replacement. But what I would say about this world is there are conspiracy th series, theories, excuse me, piled on top of other conspiracy theories. And then because social media allows every foolish person to have a voice, uh, you have kind of inane variations that again, vary by country and vary by whatever bizarre facts they're choosing. But those are some of the basic ideas. Marilyn, do you want to extend on that? If not, I can move on. Um, I, no, I think Daniel really covered it all, but um, and, he, and he touched on this just briefly about how um, a lot of this, uh, these these conspiracies about abortion, about LGBTQ rights, et cetera, eventually are blamed on the Jews because it's this idea that somehow, one, the Jews are responsible for liberal uh, policies, liberal social policies, um, that, you know, uh, that the that this is something that, you know, globalists want and the Jews are globalists. So things like that, I, I, that, I, that I would just... Just want to point out to our audience that this is something that we see on a you know regular daily basis in our work at ADL that Jews are being blamed for all the things that that Daniel talked about in terms of the variations. Feminism is another one, which is you know preventing women from having traditional roles and having you know babies, white babies. So like it it just uh, at, at some point it does get attributed you know to Jews being being behind this. Um, yeah. Um, and with apologies, I'm sorry, I'm going to jump in because I wanted to expand on one point. Um, 
one thing that's often missed is the tremendous change in attitudes towards women um, in this movement over the last 30 years. Um, it used to be a sexist, but old fashioned sexist view of women as this delicate flower who needed to be protected by white males. And part of the job was to um, you know, be strong and resist because it's a brutal world out there. Um, there is still that sentiment among some, but it's a much more really violently misogynistic discourse right now where any idea of female sexuality is immediately pounced upon and degraded. Uh, tremendous threats, I suspect, frankly, to some of my fellow panelists here um, about uh, simply being a woman and uh, having to kind of dare have a public life. And so this movement has gone really from kind of old fashioned traditional sexism to, in my view, a much more dangerous and troubling form. Um, and again, this is something we're seeing not just in the United States, but globally. Thank you, Daniel. And that intersection of misogyny and white supremacy is also something that COE at Maryland, the team that Maryland is on, um, touches upon a lot. Um, so Marilyn, I'd like to turn it back to COE's work and to you. How unprecedented is what COE is seeing right now uh, in this great replacement sphere, as opposed to decades in the past? Is there a lot more collaboration? Is there a lot more mainstreaming and normalization? You know, what is COE seeing? Yeah, well, I, I think um, the word is normalization of attitudes that are um, hateful, first of all, and misogynistic, as, as Daniel just mentioned, but also um, this idea that um, I, you know, I may not uh, either like what you what you believe, or I don't like your ideas about immigration. Anything that people disagree on becomes, um, you know, a legitimate a legitimate response will be you know, anger, rage, and possibly even violence. And I, 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 I'm I, seeing this uh, just in our work in all sorts of ways. I'm getting away from the Great Replacement to be, you know, um, you know, clearly, but we're seeing that, you know, people are showing up at um, hospitals, uh, school boards, at, you know, election, um, you know, committees, all sorts of places to express rage and anger at what they think of as the destruction of traditional America. And, and this ties in with the great replacement because that is something that they see as part of it. I think that um, in all the times, you know, all the time I've been at ADL, which is 25 years, I think that this is the time uh, that there's the, the, the line between the mainstream and the extreme is graying more and more and more. And I think this is of tremendous concern, tremendous concern. You know, I, um, I look at, uh, I monitor where uh, extremism enters the mainstream and I'm just seeing more and more of it every day. Uh, just looking at, uh, for example, the number of extremist politicians who are running for office or, or who are on the cusp between the extreme and the mainstream. So I think we have, this is something to be truly concerned about and um, that we have to you know, keep monitoring and keeping an eye on it because as Sarah mentioned before, the anti-democratic um, means and strategies that are being promoted by uh, people who are considered mainstream to some degree is alarming. And that includes people who are in office as well or used to be in office at some, at, at one point. So um, yeah, and I will stop there. Thanks so much, Marilyn. We have time for about two more questions. Um, this, the last two could be answered by any of you on the panel. Um, can you guys discuss the rhetoric around invasion? And I know this was touched on a little bit earlier, but the rhetoric around invasion, how it relates to Great Replacement, how, how figures in the media um, are trying to name migrants as a real invasion and what implication that might have for our future, for our policy. Um, so if Sarah or, or Marilyn or Daniel, if you wanna start us off on this one. Sarah, do you wanna? Yeah, I don't, I don't have a, um, probably the most to say on it, but I would just note that when you frame it that way, the only logical counter response is war. Um, and these are, 
the people that are coming here, especially the the asylum seekers who make up the bulk of the you know people that these great replacement uh, folks are obsessed with, um, are just like the ancestors of all the white people who live here, um, coming here for what they think is going to be a better life. And none of our ancestors had to fit into a box uh, to qualify for asylum or to have an employer-based visa or to win a green card lottery to get here. Again, it was an open borders um, regime. Uh, we've always had porous borders for, for white folks and uh, very, very tall walls for everybody else. Um, so just something to keep in mind that the folks that you see waiting to come in and seek asylum are the moral equivalent of your great grandparents um, and have as much right to, much, much moral right to be here as any of our ancestors did. Um, so I'll, I'll just end with that. Thank you, Sarah. Daniel? Um, there's, when you're having a public argument, and unfortunately in our discourse today, part of what gets you noticed is screaming the loudest or somehow taking an idea and pushing it to an insane and illogical extreme. And I would love to say that tactic doesn't work. Uh, but unfortunately it does seem that people are convinced or at least animated by these exaggerations. And you know, despite, I'll say repeated debunking of this, where you would have you know, people on the ground say, you know, look, we're not seeing invasion, we're just seeing you know, at times fewer people than we've seen in the past. Um, it doesn't seem to matter. Um, and I would stress what Sarah said, that when you take this extreme rhetoric, it legitimizes extreme responses. And as a result, it's not surprising that we'll see policy distorted and at times we'll even see violence. Yeah, and I'll, um, I'll just, just add a couple of other things that I'm seeing. I mentioned before about, uh, for example, Steve Bannon talking about the invasion of Normandy and, and, and equating what's happening at the border with that. And, and as Sarah said, that is like the, you know, the response is war, right? That is like a declaration of war. But we're also, well, I'm also seeing, and to speak about it in a, in a general sort of way, that these very same people who are talking about the invasion at the border are saying that the current members of the current administration should not only um, be uh, impeached for their policy because letting people over the border is leading to, uh, you know, drug like like cartels and and um, people dying of overdoses all around the country, like just just go it snowballs, but that. These people in the administration deserve to be hanged and deserve um, you know, a violent end, to be jailed or hanged. This is extremely violent. This is extremely dangerous rhetoric that's being pushed out to thousands, if not millions of people on podcasts and, and uh, social media. So it's, it, it's very, I want people to understand that this is stuff we are seeing. Stuff is not the right word. These are the, this is the dangerous rhetoric that we're seeing every single day uh, in the Center on Extremism, all of us who, are, who do this kind of work. And it's very disturbing. So given all of this quite disturbing information that you've all expertly shared with us, what can we, the viewer, do to address the dangers posed by Great Replacement? What can the average person, uh, what actions can we take to combat this normalization of this rhetoric? Uh, if each of you can answer this, I'd love to start with Marilyn. I think I think that um, you know one of the one one of the purposes of this webinar, you know, really is to let people know what what is really behind this term, the Great Replacement, what the rhetoric is about, and to always speak out against bigotry and stereotyping, which is you know used against all communities, including the Jewish community, and um, something that you know we encourage people to not engage um, with this kind of like, you know, anti-immigrant rhetoric on social media, you know, since that just amplifies it and to, and to really instead like report it if you see something, um, you know, hateful being promoted uh, to, to report it and, and, and don't engage with it. And I think that um, there's so much, you know, we're seeing a lot of, a lot of rage, a lot of anger, a lot of hatred. And I, um, I, you know, my, my response usually to that is to try to be 
even more kind to people. And I know that sounds like a, you know, uh, I, however it sounds, I, I don't know any other response, but then to, to try to like not normalize this kind of behavior. Thank you, Marilyn. Sarah? Yeah, everything Marilyn said, <laughs> I echo. Um, in addition, I think it's useful to put forward an alternative vision that's actually inviting and inclusive that says that building a multiracial democracy is worthwhile. Um, that says that being a country of refuge and asylum is a good thing. Um, you know, I, we it, can't just oppose what they have to say. Um, we have to put forward a positive vision of the country that we want to build. Very, very true, Sarah. Thank you. And Daniel, finishing thoughts, please. Three quick things I think we all can do. Uh, one is uh, demand our politicians openly reject any other political figure who espouses these ideas. Right? There are acceptable lines in politics, and people have a right to say what they want, but that doesn't mean that this should be normalized. Um, the second thing is that we can contribute to causes that are fighting back. And one is the ADL. There are a range of organizations that are helping immigrant groups. There are a range of organizations that are fighting for civil liberties. Um, and we need to support those. Um, and the third is I urge people who are listening to, uh, for themselves to become politically engaged. As Marilyn said, you don't want to engage the haters on social media, but you do want to engage politically. And, and I will say for worse, certainly not for better, these people are, are engaged. And we can worry at you know at the federal level about present and Congress, but so much happens at the local level, at the county level, and that's so important to people's daily lives. And we need engaged citizens to be pushing back and come together. And that's something we all can do. Thanks so much, Daniel. Looks like we're at the end of our time here. I wanna thank all of you for joining us today and for asking such great questions. I wanna thank our panelists for sharing their amazing expertise. Please look out for a follow-up email from us sharing resources and reading content from ADL and from our panelists here on Great Replacement and White Supremacy and more. Thanks again and have a great day. Thank you, everybody. This concludes our webinar. Uh, if you wanna continue the conversation, please be sure to like us and follow us on ADL.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and again, if you see something and want to report it, please report it to adl.org forward slash report incident. Thank you very much for joining us today.